to welcome uh, Olivia Weatherburn, who is the National Extension Program Manager for Beef Plus Lamb uh, New Zealand, and also Sarah Crayford, who is the Environmental Integration Lead uh, for the same organisation. Uh, today, uh, we're going to hear a little bit about uh, the work that's actually being done by uh, Beef and uh, Lamb uh, New, New Zealand in the extension space. Um, pretty topical at the present time, having uh, seen the news the other day about the introduction of, uh, of taxes on methane in, uh, in New Zealand. It actually made the news in Australia, which uh, doesn't happen that frequently, unfortunately. Um, now, uh, in specifically, I might just hand over. I think you're leading off, aren't you, Olivia? Um, yes, that's good. Um, very good. I'll let you uh, let you begin. I haven't actually got uh, the blurb here in regards to uh, your actual role, but as I said, you are the program lead uh, for extension. I'll let you take it away. Cool. Thank you very much, Graham, and welcome everybody uh, over in Australia and in New Zealand. And um, yeah, it's unfortunate we don't make the news for more exciting uh, and more great news uh, other than um, the likes of our Hawaka Ikanoa and our taxation that is being talked about over here at the moment. And you will actually hear a little bit about that in this presentation is, is one of our case studies that we're going to share with you today. Uh, so as Graham said, I'm Olivia Weatherburn and I'm the National Extension Program Manager at Beef and Lamb New Zealand and based in the lower South Island of New Zealand. I'm actually the most southern uh, employed uh, closest to the penguins and we live on a 700 hectare sheep and beef property which my husband is a block manager for. We've just finished lambing and um, looking forward to hopefully the grass starting to grow now and getting into a successful season. I've been with Beef and Lamb for just under eight years in the extension space as an extension manager for the majority of my time and then most recently in my current role. And today, Sarah and I are just going to take you through a New Zealand perspective of extension and Sarah will introduce herself when um, we get to her part. So we're just going to start with a little bit of introduction in regards to who we are and what we do and then how we go about doing it. And then we're going to dive into a bit of a case study, as I mentioned, that is going to actually relate to what you have been over there in Aussie hearing on the news and definitely in New Zealand won't have missed. And just in regards to some of the learnings and how we've gone about sharing that information with our farmers across New Zealand. So I'm just going to share my screen with you all. We'll get into it. So who are we? Beef and Lamb is a farmer owned industry organisation which represents our sheep and beef farmers across New Zealand and we invest in farmers levies and into programs that grow the sheep and beef industry and provide sustainable returns now and for future generations. Uh, so uh, equivalent to in Australia would be MLA uh, from what we understand. And we have had some conversations in the extension space with them in the past. So just to take a look at Beef and Lamb New Zealand strategy and how this all kind of fits into where, ex and where extension fits into this. Our vision is sustainable and profitable farmers, thriving rural communities valued by all New Zealanders. And out to the right there, you can see um, the main priorities that we're working on underneath that strategy. And the first one there is supporting farming excellence. And this is where we want to be able to enable our farmers to run sustainable and profitable farming systems. And to do that, we support farmers to achieve world by delivering the world's best research, uh, innovation and extension. So this is where our extension work really fits in as to this top priority. But it also links into the two below. The second one being celebrating our farmers who are championing the sector. We wanna position the sector to be well respected and supported by New Zealanders and have policies that enable our farmers to be the world's best red meat producers. And then that links into the increasing market returns, where our farmers are receiving increased value for our sustainable farming systems and natural grass-fed beef and lamb. And we identify the, this by create market opportunities, dismantle the barriers and grow consumer preferences for New Zealand's beef and lamb. And there's different teams throughout our organisation that work on that. 
So it's our people, partnerships and technology and data that enable us to be able to meet these priorities. And as I said, we're going to go into a little bit more depth today on supporting the farming excellence side of things. And that is where our extension fits in. So this is our farming excellence strategy at a glance. Back in 2019, we did a big review of our excellence strategy and refreshed it. And it set out, at the outcome of it was to set out a six step process to ensure that investments that beef and lamb makes on behalf of farmers delivers tangible results inside the farm gate. And you can see these here in the circle. It's the overall vision is to have world class research, innovation, and extension programs that support farmer excellence now and into the future. So, as you can see, there is um, six, six things here with farmers in the centre. So, our motto being five farmers, four farmers. Everything we do is led by farmers, and we have a number of ways we do this, and I'll go through some of those soon. Each of these steps is detailed, is, provides beef and lamb with detail on what we can invest in now and into the future and each step involves a program of work either collecting information or returning the information back to farmers and they are all interdependent but in the underpinning one as you can see right around the outside is the people and capability because without people and being able to enable them that we can't ha be out, have farmers doing what they do every day and so this is our underpinning program where we can ha have on-farm skills, leadership and attraction and retention. But then we can look into each one of these as well. So if we look at identifying future trends and farmer needs, this is where we, like, we prioritise our action. So at the moment, it is in regards to our taxations that are being set on farmers in regards to emissions. So that is what our real focus is on. We're looking at what really needs to be focused on and what are the needs of our farmers. And this is where we're looking at hearing our farmers' voices. The science and innovation is investing in science and innovation and it is farmer initiated innovation. So what the farmers are, not what the latest scientists are wanting and is what farmers are needing to know about. And it's farm focused research, what putting it back onto everyday farms. Extension tools and resources. And this is a space where a majority of our extension team work in, where it's user testing and being able to supply a library of research for them to be able to go and make informed business decisions on farm. The farmer focused delivery, where that isn't going to involve our on farm demos, our extension delivery, and where we partner and we work with farmers to be able to get that information. And I'll go into one of those being our farmer council soon. And then input measuring and reporting. So how are we going to track the progress in the data collection? So that at a glance is what the majority of our extension program is based off at Beef and Lamb Zealand. Now events are, tra are traditionally what we refer to when and think about usually when we think about an extension method. But we know everyone learns differently and at different speeds and with different levels of confidence. And this puzzle explains just that, that there can be so many different pieces of puzzle that need to be put together for information to be shared. The extension managers across the country who are based to be able to help support farmers in their regions need to have access to as many of these extension channels as possible to enable change on farm. And we use these puzzles as touch points. And going off past research, we try to hit at least seven different pieces of this puzzle to, in order to increase confidence and to lead change. Now, we all know that with the more we hear something, the more likely we are going to go buy it as a consumer. So you might have been watching TV over the weekend. You saw something on TV that may have been a new product. Might not have thought much about it. Thought, oh, yeah, that's interesting. You might walk down the street later on this week and you'll see it again. You might see it at a demo a few weeks later. Over time, you'll get more and more interested in it, if it is down your alley, of course. And that's just the natural consumer behavior that we see things in a number of different ways before we actually go and buy something ourselves, unless we've already made that real conscious decision that we need it. And I recently read on LinkedIn that it's not nagging, 
repetition is effective communication. And it is actually comes from the marketing rule of seven as well. And that dates back as a fun fact for you that may when you are pub quiz, it may not, uh, back to the 1930s when this method was actually used first back in the movie industry back then. So it's come a long way and we're used to using it in different ways and it's great to be able to use it in our rural settings now. So we want to ensure farmers in New Zealand at present know about the rules and the policies and we're looking at these seven touch points. So Sarah will go into this a little bit more detail, but for example, they might attend a physical event, a field day or a workshop, there'll be some podcasts and some audio maybe come out of that as well and some media and digital. And this is well we explain how Beef and Land's approach to extension really works. And this diagram here helps to show that. So it's all about engagement at start. So just like when you see that ad on TV for that next new car, for example, you're engaged in the ad, you're gaining some information about it for the first time or being refreshed on some information that you may have already known. Same with our farmers in regards to a topic. So we have our key events, which are a one to 100 ratio. So these are the typical field days, uh, getting, getting out on farm, big, big numbers, um, up to or more than 100 people. Uh, usually in New Zealand, our field days will range from that 60 to 100 out in the field, uh, depending on what the topic is and where it is and timing of year, of course. We call these our Farming for Profit events over New Zealand, which Farming for Profit program is one of our signature events that help deliver on farm information to farmers with the help of steering committees, which are driven by farmers. Off these events, we have the one to 30 ratio, and what we call delivery ready workshops. And this is where we start to pull the engagement to the next level. So for example, say we went to the field day with the one to 100 and the topic was lucerne. And there was a number of farmers at that workshop who really enjoyed the topic, uh, the topic that was there on lucerne. So there may have been a number of other topics as well. Uh, delivered on that one day at the bigger field day, they might go to delivery ready workshop just based on lucerne. So to dive into it a little bit more, find out the in and outs, what, what it's all about, how I grow it on my property a little bit more. They then can dive down the next step of what we call the action groups. Now you may have heard this referred to, um, especially by Denise B as well, I know who's had a lot to do with APN, as the RMPP action groups. These are now known as the Beef and Lamb action groups after um, Beef and Lamb adopted the action group program from the Red Meat Profit Partnership back in April, 2021. And these action groups are made up of farms from seven to nine farming businesses, where they come together to be able uh, common goals and objectives to work on something in a lot more depth than what they would at a one to 100 or one to 30 ratio. So smaller group learning, and we know the smaller group learning has a really good effect on being able to get change on farm. So those action group members may all want to look at lucerne and their summer pastures and to be able to produce more lambs faster to get them off earlier, for example. So they can dive into that. And then that last bit of that cycle is the knowledge hub and that's self-driven. So that may be that they want to get one-on-one -on -one at the farm consultant going out off that smaller group learning to be able to really night narrow it down. Well, they might want to go and do some more reading on the, their own. We have a knowledge hub on our website and you, um, people can visit that to be able to go through their own learnings, whether it's a learning module by step by step or reading a fact sheet. And that's where that comes in. And across the bottom, you can see the, the, it's engagement, enablement and implementation. And it all pulls itself together. So we're being from this top. So looking at if we remember our circle from before and our needs and our farmer needs, it's being initiated from the top in regards to what those topics are going to be. And then from the bottom up, having farmers inputting into that to be able to get our flow and get that change on farm or the information required for farmers to make informed decisions on farm. So a little bit more on the how, and you have heard me refer to the regional farmer councils and our extension managers. 
So to, in order for our team to be able to have some structure into what they're doing and also to be able to plan each year, we have uh, some a thing called regional delivery plans or RDPs. And the, around those, it's really essential that we have our pharma councillors. So our pharma councils, we've got our New Zealand divided into seven regions. Um, so also noting that we're a little bit smaller than Australia, uh, but we have seven regional pharma councils, which, which are made up from a selection of farmers in those areas that are dotted from all around that region. And they are like a sounding board for the nine extension managers. So um, two, there's a couple of extension managers that share a pharma council. So that's why there's more extension managers than regional pharma councils. And those pharma council members help to be able to be more eyes and ears on the ground for the extension managers because they can't be everywhere every day and um, clone themselves to go everywhere as much as it would be nice. So they have got more eyes and ears out there, being able to tell them what's happening, what are the needs, but also give feedback on other things that we're doing in, our, in the extension, but as a business as a whole, so that we can get that feedback in. We've got our steering committees as well, which have sit on the likes of our farming for profit programs, and they're farmer driven as well. So they are a group of farmers that want to be able to have input into what is being delivered at days. And they come together to help bring those larger field days to life. And that also can help feed on what the needs are of the region and where we are best to spend our levy money. And then we've got the farmer needs that sit on the, out the side there. So whether that's been directed from the likes of our government at present to what we're actually going to, farmers are gonna to require to know going forward. So our regional delivery plans understand what happens in the last 12 months. It undertakes a farmer needs analysis and it establishes a delivery method to engage people. And it's by farmers and created for farmers. Uh, it's regional priorities and desired outcomes. So each region might be a wee bit different. So from the top of New Zealand to the bottom of New Zealand, there will be some differences and that is um, what it is meant to be. And it helps to determine budgets as well. But what this RDP does, it becomes the extension manager's guide and basis of planning for the year to come. And it gives them some a guide sort of to go off in regards to what's being thrown at them. And it ensures that what is being delivered into the region is what farmers have asked for and it reflects on the past and it looks back into the future. So that is a very quick rundown of how we at Beef and Lamb look at extension and some of our models. Sarah is now going to take you through a bit of a case study in regards to climate change and what we've been doing in that extension space. So Sarah, I'll hand over to you. Awesome. Thanks all for joining us. Um, so my name's Sarah Crowfoot um, and I've been with Beef and Lamb New Zealand for a bit over two years. Um, I started initially um, in the extension team as an extension manager, and now I am the environment integration lead. Um, so still working very closely with the extension team, but um, predominantly around our environmental extension resources and um, our climate change workshops um, is one of the ones that I'm very involved in. So to give you a bit of a flavor of what's going on, first, um, a bit of context in the background. Um, in 2019, in response to the Paris Agreement, um, uh, we introduced the Zero Carbon Act. Liv, are you changing my slides or am I? Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, we um, introduced, so this, the Zero Carbon Act introduced in 2019 was New Zealand's um, response to implementing its um, obligations under Paris. Um, there were, there's kind of three key things that happened um, that, that they did in this piece of legislation um, of great significance for the agriculture industry that we then had to build programs around. Um, there's a series of, there's three targets for um, emissions reduction um, and the government took a split gas approach um, and it was the first country in the world to do so at that time. Um, so basically had different targets for the long lived gases of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide um, than they did for the short-lived gas of um, 
of methane. Um, so you can see those so those targets there. So they 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 they're, they're increasingly important um, to us going forward. This piece of legislation also said that um, agricultural emissions were going to be priced by 2025. Um, and originally proposed that they went in, into the emissions trading scheme, which wasn't going to reflect this um, split gas approach. Um, and so it established um, a program called Haywalki Kanoa and a series of milestones for that program. Um, so the Haywalki Kanoa program is a um, partnership. Um, it's the Primary Sector Climate Action Partnership. There was 13, 13 partners across um, industry and government. Um, and including um, including iwi, um, and basically what it was tasked with doing was finding an alternative um, to um, pricing emissions um, at the processor level through the emissions trading scheme. Um, and so, an alternative that would enable um, the system to and the price that farmers were charged to reflect what they were doing on farm, and also separate the price of methane. Um, for, from the price of car, um, carbon through the emissions trading scheme, um, which would reflect that split gas um, outcome, which was so significant um, for the sector, just because of how much methane domin dominates the agriculture industry's um, emissions. Um, and um, so there was a series of milestones in there that the sector had to meet, which were pretty ambitious um, and have driven a lot of our extension activity over the last 12 months. So um, by the end of last year, so by the 31st of December 2021 or the 1st of January 2022, 25% of farmers had to know their numbers, so have a documented annual total of their greenhouse gas emissions um, and have a written plan in place to measure and manage their greenhouse gas emissions. Then by the end of this coming year, so we've got a few more months to go, 100% um, of farmers over 80 hectares have to have to know their emissions numbers. Um, and then we've got until the start of 2025 to get the rest of the farms to have a written plan. Um, the other sort of significant milestone is that pricing is going to kick in 2025. And that's what you've heard a lot of noise about in the past week, because uh, the government last week came out with its response um, to what it thought that might look like on the back of the partnerships recommendations earlier in the year. So meeting these milestones has... Um, has driven a lot of our um, extension activity. Um, and we've taken multiple approaches um, to how we've done this. As Liv was talking about earlier, you know, farmers need to hear the information, um, you know, at least seven times before it sinks in um, and sort of get familiar with concepts um, and then do um, some of the more technical stuff. So we've done a lot of um, kind of mass media, um, you know, one to many, um, you know, building farmer awareness. So have done these through a variety of channels through um, farmer emails, media releases, um, newspaper articles, um, magazine articles, uh, fact sheets, podcasts, videos, um, you know, radio interviews. So um, a whole lot of stuff at various points of time to just kind of make farmers familiar with what's coming, build that awareness, give them key updates because it has been a space that's quite complicated and moving quite quickly. Um, so a lot of different, um, you know, reinforcing messages um, over time and also building on some of those previous messages. Um, there's also, we've developed a lot of supporting technical resources. Um, so I think Erin's on the call, has had a, had a huge role in, um, in these. Um, so there's a series of kind of user guides um, and examples and sort of more technical fact sheets if farmers want to delve a bit deeper. Um, and so these all live um, on our knowledge hub. Um, so for that kind of one-to-one -one self learning that um, Liv was talking about, um, there's lots of great resources and learning modules and fact sheets. They can delve deeper into any of the um, kind of any of the topics they um, they may um, may want and these also are very useful um, in our workshops I'll talk about shortly. Um, we've also um, the greenhouse gas calculator. Um, we developed a free greenhouse gas calculator um, to so that farmers were, weren't being regulated into paying yet another subscription with some of the um, existing suppliers and was specific to um, uh, you know for the for the sheep and beef sector. Um, 
And so we've also developed like instructional videos and um, fact sheets on how to, and user guides on how to use that tool. Um, and that tool has also been the foundation of the workshops we've been running um, uh, to put farmers through how to know their numbers. So the structure of that workshop, it's a, it's a three hour workshop um, that we've delivered face to face. Um, and it's got three key, um, three key components. Um, the first kind of half an hour or so is kind of all about the policy context. Um, love Jim, flick to the next slide. Um, all about the policy context and um, you know what Hawaki Kanoa is, um, what their emission sources is, why this is important to do. Um, because everyone's coming in with a different um different level of knowledge. Um, we then um take them through the calculator um and what's expected, um, and then they individually or if they've brought another person from their business basically work through actually doing the calculation while we go um while we go around and um support them answer any questions and you know can have more in-depth conversations on certain things at that time um and just check that they've done done their calculation um correctly um they then move into a break um, and that works really well for having that break in the middle just to break it up, but also to allow those who have finished earlier, they just get a longer break and it um, don't feel like you're holding up um, the other ones because they're always quite happy to catch up with someone um, else who's at the workshop. Um, then we work through kind of what their numbers mean um, and how they, how they might compare to others because, um, again, it's an area that's quite knew there's a lot to get their heads around um, and the numbers can be quite foreign to people. So work through that um, with them to help build that understanding um, and what's driving their emissions, which then leads into them completing um, their greenhouse gas farm plan um, and what having discussions in groups about what mitigations are possible um, and getting some of those things documented. Um, so it's worked and by the end of the workshop, they've effectively helped us meet um, our two key um, um, two key milestones um, for the Hawaki Kanoa program. Um, and um, yeah, and it's been, been really successful. So in the last um, uh, 12, 12 months, we have done over, I think it's over 250 workshops and put over three and a half thousand people through. So this falls sort of between, we consider this a delivery ready workshop, um, but we want fewer people than we might take at a delivery ready workshop. So we kind of target um, 15 to 20 people is kind of the optimal size. You can do it with up to 30. It works okay. You just need additional support people there. Um, so if you're going to do it with 30, um, you just need to have... Um, two or three people that are able to support um, the actual doing of the calculation. Um, that's the main bit that's um, constrained um, constrained by numbers. Um, and that's the same thing we found with, um, with COVID hitting and operating under um, a lot of, we've had a lot of restrictions um, and, you know, several, we've lost several, given the tight timeframes we're under to try and get um, a whole sector to know their emissions number in about 12 months. Um, losing losing months to COVID was quite um quite a, quite a challenge for us um so we did test um online delivery of the workshops um it works it works okay it's um it's not the same but the real challenge we had was doing um doing the calculator itself um online in a group setting um because you really need to see their screen um so we we do do we do still do some online workshops um it's not our primary method of delivery um but the policy and the action plan side works okay. So we often do run webinars um, just without the calculator content. And that also helps for farmers who know their numbers already through another tool, such as Overseer Farmax. So they don't need to do that milestone, but still want the rest of the information. Um, works really well there. Um, and then we also do some um, kind of drop-in sessions or clinics. So if we have done an online workshop and they need follow-up support to just check that um, their numbers, um, their numbers been done right, we can we do that kind of one-on-one -on -one online so that they can share their screen and um, we can work through that. And we also have got an 0800 number and a specific kind of email help box um, that farmers can 
um, send questions and things through um, and we can follow up uh, for a bit of support. Um, we've also developed, uh, delivered a lot of these workshops um, and helped to raise awareness through a number of partnerships. Um, and that's been really key for us reaching, to try and reach 100% of the sector is um, never something as an organization we've been able to achieve um, on our own. And so we've partnered with, um, the meat companies have been great. They're also a partner to um, to Hewaki Kanoa. Um, so they also have to help meet the milestones. So we've done, done probably about 100 of the workshops we've delivered have been done in partnership with one of the meat companies. Um, and so they have been able to use their reps to reach out and encourage their suppliers to come along to specific events in their region. Um, that's been really effective. Have also done a lot with um, Deer Industry New Zealand, who's another another partner, um, and with catch, catchment groups um, are very very interested in doing it. So again, you've got a got a captive group. Very work works quite similarly to to the action group, um, and then also using um, banks and accountants um, who have have really strong relationships. Um, with their with their customers and with their clients, um, and they're supporting them either to actually do the calculation themselves or also just having that conversation about you know do you know your numbers do you know what's coming and just you know using another channel to kind of try and reach reach these people um, and they they're able to um, yeah to support them through the process or funnel them into workshops that are coming up um, in areas so um, and then I think the final Final bit. What um so what have we learned from the um what have we learned from the last kind of year and what have we worked? Um partnerships, um sort of something we've known um for a while. Partnerships work and they're really, really effective. They really extend our reach, but they do take a lot of managing. Um and so getting that um set up is um set up and having appropriate steps in place is really important. Um where the calculator is is hard to deliver online in a group setting. Um, you really need to be able to see their screen. Also very hard to support over the phone. Um, you need to be able to see their screen to see what's going on. Um, it's reinforced how important it is to use multiple channels um, and also to be able to plan um, um, for all the different um, different learning, um, learning styles that are out there. Um, Internal communications and making sure all the different parties, it's been a huge, huge program for us. Um, and there's a lot of different people, both internally and with external facilitators. Um, so clear messaging and making sure everyone's on the same page and is updated regularly has been really important. Um, and um, yeah, clear, clear run sheets um, and just yeah, making sure, making sure everyone's on the same page have sort of been some of the key learnings, but happy to um take any questions or dig into any bits in more detail that may be of interest to people. So a couple of chats come up. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, firstly, Chrissy um, wants to know what sorts of numbers you would have as a maximum for these workshops and have you changed this over time? Uh, yes, yeah, so we um, probably max out at about 30 um we have we have had some that have been more like 35 or 40 but um as i said yeah definitely if you're going to have them that big um the you need you need multiple people there supporting them so it's not impossible but you just you need you need that um there's elements of it that need that one-on-one -on -one support um the optimal size is about um, is about fifteen, um, kind of fifteen to twenty. Um, but I, the other thing is you can you can handle more people, um, so you can have twenty to twenty five businesses if you've got two people from each business. So you kind of you don't necessarily without additional people don't want to be doing more than kind of fifteen businesses in a workshop just to make sure you can get around everyone and um, work through um, work through that. That's great. Um, Graham wanted to know what proportion of the livestock industry has participated so far. Uh, so of the sheep and beef industry, so we've got about 85% of the commercial sheep and beef farmers. 
So we have we've used commercial Gen B farmers as our metric, which is slightly different um, from the program's metric, just because it's um, they're the ones who are likely to be affected by um, by pricing when it kicks in. Um, uh, and the dairy industries, they've pretty much got all of them there. I think they're sitting at about 95% because the processing companies had all the information already that they needed to do it um, through various other things. So they've they've basically completed numbers for um, all of their suppliers and provided them. Um, yeah. So, and the, uh, yeah, uh, that was just livestock, wasn't it? Yep. So, and Hort and Arable are also ticking away. Um, they've got a few to go still. Thank you. Um, Bruce would like to know, how do the farmers feel about the program at the moment? For example, top-down big stick or bottom-up farmer-owned and driven? I can start there when I feel uh, like here. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ugly. Um, so just in regards to the actual GHG um, calculator program and the workshop, it's more the farmer dr owned and driven for the fact that they're coming in to actually understand their own numbers and have an understanding. So it is one of those things in regards to it's an information sharing. So it's enabling them to be able to have those conversations further up the table with what's being they're being hit with at the moment. Um, but um, they we're trying to ensure from a beef and lamb perspective as part of these workshops we can involve them as much as possible in that process. Sarah, you might have something else you want to add there as well. Uh, yeah, no, the workshops themselves have been really well received. Um, the whole pricing conversation less so, but we've tried to keep the workshops very much focused on their business and what they can control and um, using it to demystify the process and all the noise that is in the media um, and trying to give them a bit more power because if they know their numbers, they can um, understand what pricing is actually going to mean in their business and um, have a sort of informed view and be able to put that into context and also it, it kind of empowers them to um, to understand what's driving, um, you know, emissions in their business, and it becomes that one of the myriad of factors they can factor in um, when they're making decisions um, into the future. Thank you. Um, Prue would like to know what farmer feedback uh, you've had on both the ease of use and accuracy of the calculator. Yeah, so um, has been... Ease, ease of use varies, um, kind of all farmers are different and their level of technical um, kind of understanding is different. Um, so some farmers find a, a complete walk in the park, others um, others struggle a, a little bit uh, balancing stock recs. Um, anyone who's worked with farmers on stock recs knows that it's probably one of the biggest challenges um, around that. That is our biggest challenge with the, with the tool. Um, it is very much designed around a set of accounts and information that farmers already have. Um, but we haven't, haven't not managed to get anyone through it. So um, I think that's a pretty good um, testament to, to ease of use, even if, um, there's a couple of headaches along the way. Um, and the accuracy is um, is pretty good. Our target when we built it was um, to kind of be within 10% of some of the more detailed tools. Um, and I think they ran about 200 farms through all three. And I think the average was about a 3% variation between um, beef and lamb and farm acts and overseer and like if you compare the amount of information that goes into our tool versus Farmax, um, there's a whole lot more um, that goes into Farmax. So, um, so yeah, pretty um, reason, reasonably happy, um, um, happy with that. Um, and obviously, once there, it's at the moment it's sort of an awareness building game and giving farmers a starting point. Once they're actually getting a bill, um, there's going to be a whole lot of standardization that goes on um, between between the tools um, to give us one central calculator that'll actually get used to generate generate emissions bills. So um, that'll be another that'll be another stage when that obviously accuracy becomes even more important. Chrissy would like to know what happens next year when they have to recalculate. Um... So they don't have to recalculate next year. Um, 
the they won't have to recalculate until although we do um we do encourage them to have a look you know at five or ten years ago for their farm and just see how things have changed over time but at the moment the obligation is they only have to have one number um the challenge is 2025 when pricing kicks in they'll have to do um that year's emissions um and um we can't say for sure what's going to happen because the government hasn't decided um, what pricing is going to look like and until they've kind of built a system, um, uh, hard to say. But um, it's likely that some of the uh, legal declarations they're making to the government already around stock numbers and fertilizer use um, through things like their annual accounts are likely to be a core part of um that process when they have to do it but yeah that's what the consultation is on one of the things that's on at the moment so we won't know more until probably mid 2023 about what system farmers are actually going to have to have to sign up for but getting them through that system will take uh all of industry um that it will take all kind of the various people involved in the supply chain will probably be kind of reinforcing that message um, to get that to happen because it is it'll happen pretty quickly. Thank uh, there, you. Yeah, Graham you know, Harris here. There was one more question there that Chrissy had in regards to the number of people you have involved in the actual delivery of the workshops, and it's a double barrel. Um, how have you resourced that? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got um, we've got about twenty people around the country that deliver the workshop um, that we've trained. So they all had base level climate change knowledge and have been through various. So they had good climate change knowledge, and then we basically upskilled them on the calculator and our workshops and what we're doing. Um, and we provide kind of ongoing to support and sounding boards and check in with them as we go. Um, and they're delivered in tandem. Normally, there's often a one of the beef and lamb extension managers is also at those workshops, um, helping helping to support them as well. Um, um, and the delivery and the extension managers are all um, pretty savvy with the calculator now. Um, after having done um, quite a few, so they're there to support as well. Um, beef and lamb has funded a lot of it through our regional delivery plans um, to date, um, and as part of our kind of farm planning budget that was part of our farm planning rollout. Um, but we also have um, co-funded a number of them with um, uh, the various partners. So um, the meat companies and things have, have pitched in for some of um, some of the workshops. Um, and the calculator build itself was actually funded. Um, Beef and Lambs put a lot of additional funding into it, but its original development was funded by the Red Meat Profit Partnership, which I'm sure Denise has talked talk to you a lot about. So that was a partnership between government, um, Beef and Lamb, um, some of the meat companies and some of the banks. And they use a lot of data off our economic service, which is a service that has been going for over 70 years. So I see a question there in regards to could it be used in Australia? So it is based off New Zealand system and off the data that was being collected here, which is the is what we understand the largest um, set of consistent data that over a consistent period in the world um, for sheep and beef farmers. So that is what the calculator is based on. So you couldn't pick that calculator up up today and go and use it in Australian conditions. I, I see also there's a question about IP there too. <laughs> From Bruce, you want to comment on that? Obviously, we would need to do a fair bit of work to make it work in Australia. Yeah. So it's under it's underpinned by the economic service data. So they have to select um, the region, the region and farm class they're um, they're farming. So whether they're hard hill country, hill country, um, finishing, mixed finishing, um, and um, yeah, which island? Because um, we basically then underpin um, their stock number and transaction informations with what average sale dates and weights and growth rates and various things are in those regions. So um, yeah, so. Without that, um, yeah. it's not particularly um, transferable. Um, no. yeah. And it also means at the other end, they're not just getting their own number, they're able to benchmark themselves automatically. So at the end of the calculator, it does provide some benchmarking data to where for they are sitting compared to the rest of their area so that they can get a set on, oh, does that number, is it good or is it bad? Because we, at this stage, 
government haven't really outlined what is good, what is bad, but in regards to where they're sitting to be to their peers, they can have a good that they're not way out, the black sheep out the side, they can see where they are. Well, Prue Cook has a question. Um, how do farmers feel about the results that they get and have their emission levels been higher than they'd anticipated? Or lower for that matter? Um, I think a lot of them have been lower than they anticipated. I think possibly because the conversation started in the dairy industry first. So they were hearing dairy numbers, which were obviously per hectare significantly higher than um, sheep beef ones. So I think a lot of them have been surprised at how low they are. But um, but yeah, you get the odd one who I guess probably didn't really know what to expect. Because um, yeah, they take, it takes a little bit to get them to understand what it means. Um, and that benchmarking is really important because the first question you always get is, um, oh, is it good or bad? And what's good or bad very much depends on what type, what class of land you're farming and how much grass you grow and what your rainfall is. And so that's why that regional um, and farm class level benchmarking is, is really useful because it gives them a little bit of a sense of like for like, um, are you within the same ballpark? And I think for a lot of circumstances also, just to add on to that there, Graham, is that especially if they're doing it through their catchment group or the likes that they've potentially been pulled in with the group and may not have, attended otherwise um so for some of them it's they don't know what they don't know and so for a lot of them it is their first time so they don't come in with any really expectations no. um we think back to um about five six years ago when our health and safety laws came in with beef and lamb we did a similar big project in regards to delivering health and safety to farmers and it was that thing farmers came in quite um yeah they didn't want to give out information. They were scared who was going to get it, but they were also thought it was going to be hard. And I, we're seeing that as part of these workshops as well. And Sarah, um, you can comment if you're any different is in regards to they come quite guarded and thinking it's going to be quite difficult. And they come at the other end with one, because they know a little bit more and they're actually able to have the conversation and understand the lingo. It gives them the more confidence when they walk out that door. Okay, there's a, there's a question there from Bruce. Hancock is just asked, are the meat companies realising the value they thought they'd get from it? It'll be early days yet, but yep. Yeah, I'd say early days. Um, I think the meat company's initial commitment is because they're a partner in the program, they have to um, do their bit to support the program. But certainly Silverfern Farms has been um, very actively engaged in it. And then partway through... The partnership we've had with them they've also launched their zero carbon beef product um and so certainly it's um opened the door to a lot of suppliers to potentially participate in that so the combination of doing these workshops and getting that exposure and and then the ones we do in conjunction with them we we talk about the opportunity through the zero carbon meat program and it's also a really nice example of the fact that this isn't just regulatory push there's hopefully some some um be it market benefits and there you know there's increasing market expectations and requirements and free trade agreements that you're going to know your numbers so um it's trying to show kind of both sides a bit of bit of carrot um kind of as well as the regulatory push um but so yeah but the meat companies have been been yeah ha like really happy with their involvement um with the program it's also given them a platform to be able to have build stronger relationships with their clients which they don't usually get the opportunity to so okay. it's had yeah a two-tier approach in that because other than going to yeah sell stock for them or um seeing them at on farm for maybe a sale they don't usually get that bigger interaction with them so this gives them that opportunity bruce has a follow-up question specifically about the extension program um are you happy to share with us is the, is the prelude to this um, the biggest thing you got wrong in your plan? Um, I, our time frames at the beginning were incredibly ambitious. Um, there was a fairly stressful um, couple of weeks um, to try and get everything. We basically committed to delivering a whole lot of workshops when we didn't have a product and now had to get stuff through print with COVID shutdowns and stuff. And so, yeah, the the lead in time at the beginning um, was was no was nowhere near um, near long enough, and um, also yeah we kicked off. We'd done a, we'd done some pilots and stuff, so we had done the development work and knew the workshop we were going to deliver was going to 
um, was going to work. So we'd done, we'd done all that pilot development testing and things. But yeah, we started with a partnership where we did 30 workshops in two weeks and we're running six workshops a day in different parts of the country. So it was probably too ambitious our first two weeks. Um, so that was probably, um, we've definitely learned from that um, um, and have, yeah, have not tried to have that same level. We did, do, we have done another month. We did in August, I think we did 50 workshops in a month. Um, but yeah, we've never done six on one day um, again. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, that's um, um, especially especially in our first week um, as we were learning and so just the speed at which we were trying to share what you learned through around the country when you're doing um yeah, yeah. there was there was benefits of it everyone improved heaps in their delivery yeah. through that week and doing two a day day on day you got quite good at it and kind of learned from one to one but yeah that would probably be the um those initial timelines were um were not were not right for the pressure everyone was under yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that, sharing that, Sarah. I'm just uh, looking at our time. We're actually over our 45 minutes. Um, I don't see any other additional questions coming through here at the moment that I've seen. So that's been uh, very informative. Thanks very much for that. As I said, very topical, uh, even in Australia this week, um, seeing uh, some of the reaction that's uh, that's get shown, but of course the media can be quite selective. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's good to see the work that you have done in this space and it'll be interesting to see how it progresses and particularly as it goes to 25, it'll be really interesting. Um, it'll be interesting from an Australian's perspective too, because I guess we are nowhere near along that journey yet, but that may change. Who knows? We'll see where, see where it goes. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of work would have to have to happen here for us to be anywhere near, um, organized enough along that space, but we'll see where it takes us into the future. Um, are there any other questions from anyone? Uh, if they can just slip them into the chat there now while we wrap up. Um, if not, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, both uh, Liv and uh, Sarah for, um, for their presentation. It's been uh, very timely and uh, very interesting.